Yeah, thank you all um, for having me. I'm really pleased to be here to talk about sleep and fragile X syndrome. Um, so I am a lecturer at Aston now. I, I was based at Birmingham where I did my master's and my PhD in sleep. Um, but I'm going to come out completely and say I'm not, um, I'm, you know, I'm really pleased to be here, but I'm, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not um, a practicing clinical psychologist. I'm a sleep researcher. That's my background. That's my area of interest. So I can share some of our research. I'm very happy to share kind of general advice, but I won't be able to give super specific one-on-one -on -one advice for your situation just because I'm not able to know all of the factors and do kind of a full assessment. So I hope that's okay. That's my first disclaimer. Usually these sorts of disclaimers are, I work for this drug company. Um, and mine slightly different. Uh, the second one is just to acknowledge that I am a sleep researcher. I'm not a fragile expert, which all of you guys are. Um, I've done a little bit of work in fragile X, but really only a tiny thing. So I'm actually here to learn from you. Um, this photo here, this is just to say I have an affinity for the society. This is me back in 2016, uh, squished in the back there behind Kate Woodcock, who some of you might know. Um, and here uh, behind Hayley uh, in the Fragile Expedition Cog from 2016, if you remember. So this is my last interaction really with the Fragile X Society, um, which was a wonderful time, and I think this is the last time that you're in Birmingham. So I, I have uh, some familiarity with the group, but as I say, you, you are the experts, so I really appreciate sort of hearing what you've got to say on these matters as well, and hopefully this can be quite interactive. Um, so... Um, Yes, so I'm here to learn from you. Uh, the, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is really just what is sleep? Um, and, you know, what does that... We think we know what it is, but what's the brain doing? What's going on? Um, and, and what is sleep like for people with fragile X syndrome? Spoilers, there isn't a lot of research in this area, uh, which some of you probably <laughs> used to put hearing. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the research and then some strategies, which I'm imagining is kind of what a lot of you would probably want from this talk. So we know all this, but what can we actually do about it? And then I can share some resources and some questions as well. Um, just to kind of guide the discussion a bit today, if I could just have like a, sh a show of hands for how many people care for children here, sort of school aged children? Fab, adults, t teenagers? So I'm aware I'm blowing the lines. Any sort of preschoolers? Yeah. Okay. So it's basically we're across we're across the age span. So that's fine. We can we can bear that in mind as we're thinking about different problems. Um, and generally, do people here consider the person they care for to have a sleep problem? Yes, yeah, some nodding and some, some not. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So we're coming to this from different perspectives. That's borne out in the literature, actually. So it's not, when we look at the data, it's not that every child will have a sleep problem, but it's kind of useful to know who's in the room, just for me when I'm talking. Um, so the nice thing about sleep is that even if we have a sleep problem, we, we all know what sleep is, we all experience it. And we've all had bad kind of nights of sleep, so we can relate to what it's like when you're not sleeping very well. Um, but I think what people often get confused about is what's, what sleep actually is. So I think it's quite common to think, oh, it's a time when the brain just sort of switches off and you're just lying there and not doing anything. And that's actually not true. So sleep is a really, um, a time when the brain is really active in different ways. And it's actually really important to lots of aspects of wake. So lots of processes happen during sleep that make our experience of wake better. So it's associated with lots of different things, memory consolidation, healing after surgery, things like that. All of these really important processes happen when we're asleep. So sleep is important for these. But it's also not one thing. So this is a slightly complicated diagram. This is really just to say that sleep is, is made up of different stages, which you've probably heard of. So um, these ones here are kind of, uh, they're called non-rapid eye movement sleep, so non-REM. And then this one here is REM sleep, which is the one that everyone gets very excited about, because that's when you dream, and that's when you're sort of lying there paralysed, but your eyes are moving. It's a bit weird. Um, and uh, <laughs> the brain, we've already talked a bit about what, um, kind of what the brain looks like in an EEG earlier, but this is, what, this is just to sort of show that in the different stages, the brain is doing different things. So this is neuronal activity from an EEG. And the only reason I sort of draw this out is because it's important to know when we're having problems with waking, um, what, what, at what point in the cycle is that problem happening? Because what we do when we sleep is we go down through the deepening stages of sleep into REM sleep, and we'll sort of cycle through this cycle several times throughout the night. And in between, we'll have what we call a brief arousal, um, which is or a partial awakening. And we all have this all the time. So this is when we come out of our deeper sleep, sort of pop up and then go back down into the cycle again. And usually we can't remember that. But often for our, for our children with fragile X, our adults with fragile X, that might be where the, something goes wrong at that point. And that's what causes kind of a full waking that we do remember, if that sort of makes sense. So when we're thinking about sleep, it's important to know that, that we are kind of cycling through these. And it's usually that cycle change point where we, where we can get problems. 
Um, the other thing to say about sleep is that it's actually driven by two kind of processes, uh, which we call process S and process C. So process S is, is a homeostatic process. It's the same as the drive to eat or the drive to drink. We have a biological drive to sleep. So the longer we're without sleep, the more we have a kind of propensity to want to go to sleep. We've all experienced that kind of sleep deprivation and then you're just like trying to stay asleep in, in this talk. Um, <laughs> but the other process that it's driven by, which is also working against me because it's the afternoon, is process C. That's your circadian rhythm. So that's how you're uh, sort of interacting with the 24-hour light day cycle. And so what that essentially means is uh, when, when it's dark, you feel more tired <laughs> um, and there's a, a hormone called melatonin that your brain releases in response to darkness that sort of cues that process. But there are also other factors that we call zeitgebers, which basically indicate um, at what point you are in that 24-hour circadian rhythm. And when those things interact together, that's when you're most likely to fall asleep. So when it's dark and you haven't, oh, so sorry, when it's dark and you haven't been asleep for a long time. Um, so about sort of 11 p.m. So these things are interesting to know just because when we're dealing with um, uh, children that might have kind of differences in the way that they um, respond to those zeitgebers, so those environmental cues, that can really lead to sleep problems and, and that might be the case for some of our kids with Fragile X. So as I said, sleep is really important. Um, it's really important for pretty much every aspect of wake, so I've just put a few things on the screen here. But we know, for example, that when we've got sleep problems, we, uh, we can tend to feel more depressed, more anxious, and it's kind of a bi-directional relationship there. Um, we know it's linked to physical health, so if you're, if you're in pain, you might struggle to sleep. If, you, um, if you're, uh, like I say, if you've had surgery, the best time to do surgery is, if, uh, is just before bedtime so that the healing happens overnight. So there's actually studies which show that sleep is having this beneficial impact on healing. Uh, we know it's linked to learning and our ability to concentrate. So if we're feeling tired and we're irritable, we're going to struggle to listen in a talk for our kids with fragile X. That's, that could be what's going on at school. Um, and we all know that our behaviour can be a little bit off the wall if we haven't slept well. We can be a little irritable. Um, so that might, that might be kind of more self-interest behaviour, uh, perhaps more uh, behaviours directed towards others. Um, if we've got fragile X, if we don't have fragile X, it might be screaming at our partner because they didn't do the washing up. Um, so it, we all show challenging behaviour when we're irritable, don't we? But um, these kinds of things can be impacted by sleep. And there is a little bit of evidence as well to suggest that... Um, that our appetite is also affected by the way that we sleep. So we might be more likely to hoard or eat food um, with a higher fat content because we're trying to, trying to gain energy. I can see some nodding. This is something I do as well. Um, but actually, we don't sleep well all the time, and we're not really here because but, um, our children look like this perfect sleeping child. Um, in fact, sleep problems are really, really common, even in children that don't have fragile X syndrome. So actually, 6 to 43%, this is taken from a lot of the literature, will experience sleep problems at some point. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is that's a very broad ranging estimate and that's really because sleep isn't one thing and so sleep problems aren't one thing. There are lots of different types of sleep difficulties which I've listed here um, and they all have different treatment approaches. But usually when we're thinking about sleep, we're really thinking about insomnia, which is a, a kind of uh, an issue with falling asleep, so we call that a settling problem, or an issue with waking, waking at the wrong time, waking and not being able to go back to sleep, frequent waking overnight. Those are usually what we mean when we think about a sleep problem. Um, and these are um, all particularly important areas to think about when we're thinking about fragile X syndrome, where we already see some kind of differences in you know, elevated rates of anxiety, health problems, all these things. We know that it's, all, it's already really important. Um, and so what I was interested in doing is looking at how sleep problems differ across a range of genetic syndromes. So I, I, I pulled the literature on 19 genetic syndromes in total, uh, and fragile X was one of them. And what I did, um, for reasons which, <laughs> having said they're all different things, may not make sense now, but it did have a purpose, um, was I sort of smushed all the data together in what's called a meta-analysis, where you pool all the data um, of all the different types of sleep problem. And what we found overall was that about one in four people with fragile X syndrome will have a sleep problem, which that kind of matched a little bit of what was going on in the room, so that was encouraging for me. Um, but what I did identify at that time, as I said, as I hinted at the beginning, is there's a real lack of quality research in sleep and fragile X. Um, and often researchers weren't defining their sleep problems particularly well. So often what they would just ask about is whether the child has a sleep problem. And they wouldn't kind of go in and define what that meant. 
And I did that at the beginning as well. So we're all guilty of doing this as researchers. But um, they might just do sort of a quick, a quick yes or no answer. And that doesn't really encapsulate all of the difficulties. But usually when someone's doing that, they're talking about insomnia, those kinds of difficulties with settling and waking. I also found um, some evidence that bedwetting, so sleep enuresis, was, a, was quite a big problem as well. So that, those were kind of the two things that stood out, was bedwetting at night and then this kind of general sleep difficulty. But fortunately... Since um, I did the review in 2020, there's been more research that's come out. Um, and so we now actually have a very accurate kind of idea from this big cross-sectional analysis of a large cohort of the prevalence rates of different types of sleep problems. And the ones that particularly came out were, you guessed it, the insomnia type problems. So 40% of children having problems falling asleep, 36% frequent nighttime waking, and quite a high prevalence rate of excessive daytime sleepiness as well. So children feeling very tired in the day, um, which is something that did come out in the meta-analysis. And importantly, um, in this paper, they were able to model the associations with different daytime behaviours, and they found that these sleep problems were associated with irritability and aggression. So as we might expect, when our children aren't sleeping well, they're a little bit more irritable and aggressive towards others. So we know that sleep is a problem for some children with fragile X. Um, and it's not immediately clear why. So sleep, because it is so broad and complicated, there are lots of things that could be going on um, for any child or any adult, particularly our uh, kids with fragile X. Um, and so this diagram is taken from um, the guide that I wrote for Cerebra quite a few years ago now. Um, and I won't kind of be able to go into all of these things now, but they are all explained in the guide. And I think we have got a stand um, here, Cerebra have a stand here, where you can... Um, uh, find these guides but if not there's a QR code and I'll put this up at the end as well if you want to kind of come and take a photo of it um, but really what this is this guide goes through is lots of the different things that might um, cause sleep problems and again what we can do about it so if there's anything that I'm saying today that, that you'd like a bit more detail on the majority of that would be covered in the guide from this point on um, so what I'm going to do is, is just highlight a few things that I think could be relevant in fragile X syndrome um, so the first one is pain and discomfort um, and, and this is really important because um, if we're not able to sort of art articulate that we're in pain um, and we're not necessarily able to accurately label our internal state. So I know some people saying that they've got children that aren't verbal or we might have adults that aren't able to kind of accurately identify what um, the exact cause of the pain is. This can be really difficult because it can impact sleep. And so what I wanted to do um, in a research study that I did in, in two other syndromes, so not fragile X syndrome, is look at whether we could identify reliable markers of pain during children's sleep or during the kind of night. And I base this on something called the FLAC, which some of you might have come across before. Um, this is an observational tool that you can use with your child. Again, I'll, I'll put a QR code up. Um, where you basically monitor their face, their legs, their activity, their crying and their consolability. And in doing that, you can sort of rate them for different aspects that, that might be indicative of pain. And we know this from studies of children, um, infants, after they've had surgery, which would be painful. So these, these have been observed in, in kind of all groups. Um, and what I did in this paper was, as I said, look at whether these behaviours were happening overnight. So I watched, I think, about 87 hours of footage of children when they were asleep or meant to be asleep, um, and, and looked at what happened. And what we found, um, don't worry too much about the detail of, of the graph, but where you see red, that means that behaviour is, is uh, there's a high probability of it. And so what we saw is that when children woke up, they were really likely to show in the first 10 minutes after they woke up some of these painful indicators. So particularly this kind of jerking restless leg movements. I don't know if any of you have kind of seen those in your children, the sort of kicking like this. Um, and so that, that indicated that they might be in pain when they woke up. They were showing those behaviours. But importantly, what we also found was that in the five to ten minutes before they woke up, so I was able to monitor that using active watches, so I had an exact time when the children were waking that I could look sort of before and after. Um, in the before period, they were also showing those pain-related behaviours. So what we thought that meant was that for some children, some of the time, waking might actually be caused by pain. So it's not just that they're waking and showing pain-related behaviours, but the pain could potentially be causing the waking. Um, and so if this is something that you're worried about, I'd really encourage you to, to make use of the FLAC, or perhaps other, um, you, you may know of other kind of painful uh, signatures that your child shows as, as their kind of expert. 
um, you may well know of, of what kind of behaviours they show when they're in pain. If you're not sure, you can think about other behaviours that might occur. Um, have you seen the child um, suddenly become very withdrawn? Are they perhaps guarding a particular body part? Are they showing um, sort of a, they, they're wanting to approach food and then kind of uh, an unsure, unsureness about that? These other kind of indicators might, um, might potentially be indicating pain. Um, and we talked a lot today about sort of getting GPs and paediatricians to listen. Um, sometimes we find with the families that we work with that uh, if you record your child doing this and then take the flack and your scores, that could be quite helpful. And we'd also encourage you to, to maybe rate your child at a time when you know they're definitely not in pain so that you kind of have a baseline to go back to. And, and again, it might be helpful to use a video uh, for this. So that's pain. And I always talk about that one first because I think it's, it's easy to miss and, it, and it's, you know, it's really the one that ethically we should be getting right before we try and change kind of anything else. Um, but I wouldn't be a very good sleep uh, psychologist or researcher if I didn't talk a bit about sleep hygiene. So some of you will probably be familiar with these techniques. Um, and you, you may have tried them before, but it is really important to think about, particularly because of those zeitgebers I was trying to talk about earlier. When, when we have children with um, sensory differences or um, learning delay who may not be able to identify those, it's really critical that we're getting things like the bedtime routine and all the things that queue up to sleep right and giving them the best opportunity to kind of see that shift in process C in that circadian rhythm. Um, so a few very basic things you can do. Um, so consider your child's sleeping environment. Now when I say consider, I mean go into your child's bedroom and lie down in their bed at the time that they would fall asleep. So um, there might be things that are coming in, there might be a street light kind of shining in and making a strange shadow from a poster in their bedroom or there might be a, a hum from the boiler that you didn't detect in the day. Lie down and actually experience what it's like for the person that you care for and see if there are things that actually would disturb you in your sleep or there might be other things kind of going on in terms of noise or light as I said. Have a think about the temperature of the bedroom not too hot, not too cold. I know you will have heard some of these things before, but it's really important as the weather's like going up and down, think about a second duvet or a summer duvet or you know, however you want to do it. These things can make a real difference. Also be aware, given kind of sensory um, needs, think about the feeling of the bedding. Is it very scratchy? If it's quite like a um, rustly type bedding that makes a kind of irritating noise, that can be problematic for some children. Um, labels in pajamas, so I always have to cut out all of the labels in my pajamas. I can't, <laughs> can't have them like scratching me overnight. I can't wear socks to bed, for example. That stresses me out. Are there things like this that you might might know about for your child in the day that just kind of aren't happening in the same way at night? That can be really helpful. Um, and I know um, that you've uh, that on your um, fragile X. Uh, website there's been a, a post about some of the tips that you guys have shared and I know several people have suggested using white noise and um, that can kind of help in the children's bedroom that's a really good technique if you're if you wanted to try that that does work for a lot of children as well um, other aspects of sleep hygiene are um, related really to kind of diet and exercise so I think a lot of people think um, it makes sense. You think, oh, if I, if I do some exercise close to bed, I'll sort of tire myself out or I'll tire my child out. Actually, the way the body regulates temperature is really important. That's another circadian process. And that impacts sleep. So if you want to um, tire your child out by exercise, you'll accidentally wake them up just before the bedtime. Um, so the best time to do it is actually to do it sort of just after school, so maybe about four or five o'clock, kind of early evening, um, as, as before you sort of go home and have dinner and do the bedtime routine. Um, no caffeine after 3 p.m. So obviously for our adults, you know, teas and coffees. Uh, for younger children, chocolate contains caffeine. Chocolate biscuits contain caffeine. All these things that we might sort of be giving without realising that that can sort of um, uh, lead to difficulties with sleep. Um, we also talk about trying to limit the bedroom to sleep only. Now I know this can be really difficult because not everybody has a space where children can play separately. Or, um, but if you can at all, that the idea of that is really just that the child learns to associate that when I'm in this room, and particularly when I'm in this bed, I am asleep. We don't want them to associate the room or that space with playing, um, ideally not with punishment as well, so not being sort of sent to their bedroom when they've been, um, done something wrong. Um, aware this might be difficult if if you don't have a separate space where your child can play one of the things that you can do as part of the bedtime routine is kind of put away the toys that are part of play so you can have a, a part of the routine where you're sort of packing away all the toys and, and hiding them away perhaps if you've got cuddly toys they need to go to bed as well that kind of narrative can be so helpful for some children um, just as we kind of wind down and again helping to cue onset to sleep 
Um, I also have to say as well, um, avoiding screens um, is really important. I know that a lot of uh, a lot of children will be using them to communicate. I do really understand that that they will be kind of attached to the screen. If you can pop a blue light filter on it, that can really really help. So if you've got an Apple device, uh, it's called Night Shift. If you've got an Android device, you can download something called Flux, which basically works the same, and it just takes out the blue light. It sort of shift. It does make it look a bit sort of sepia, um, but uh, that's really important because that blue light blocks the melatonin release that I was talking about earlier that comes in response to darkness and, and the queuing of bedtime and melatonin is what helps us to feel sleepy so if we're blocking that with an ipad we are going to struggle to get off to sleep um, and then the importance of routine i think obviously lots lots of our kids will be you know needing routines in the day and having social stories and, and you'll all know exactly what your child kind of needs in terms of queuing but i do think it's important to I think sometimes we can sort of skip past that, but this is really, really important because of that wanting to cue um, the sleep onset. So it's really important to be consistent. I've put an example um, of a routine here, but it can be whatever sort of works for you and your family situation. Um, we'd recommend that it's about 30 minutes at least, and that again, you dim the lights at the start of the bedtime routine to again, help with that melatonin release. So help them to sort of start to wind down with, um, with the, the reduced light. Ideally, keep the timing and order the same. Um, if that's going to be problematic for your child, that they might sort of then perseverate if, if that can't happen, um, then you might want to think about flexible scheduling. So perhaps just kind of the same things but happening every now and again in a slightly different routine. Or how, however you've managed that. If, if you know about that, you're doing that in the day already. But um, if that kind of is, is worrying for you, you can do that. The other thing I'd say is try not to make it too elaborate. So ideally, it wouldn't involve... Um, you being the only caregiver that can do it and you have to stand at that point in the room on one leg and you have to read a story in that way because obviously we want you to be able to pass that on to someone else if you want to go out or you know share that burden with a caregiver another caregiver or perhaps a babysitter so if you can try and keep it as simple and sort of um, uh, rep replicable as possible that can be really really good and as I said avoid using screens caffeine play um, exercise in that routine if you can um, I would say include a bath if it's relaxing. So um, again, because of that temperature change, helping, having the bath can be really helpful because sort of, as long as it's a warm bath, it kind of cues the right um, level of temperature and it can be relaxing. Uh, for some children, it can be really stimulating. <laughs> so if that is your child, don't feel you have to put a bedtime routine, uh, a bath in your bedtime routine. You might want to do that in the morning. Um, but um, yeah, if it would be relaxing for your child, then, then that's a good addition. Um, and the key thing is, this is what I have to uh, like really sort of focus in on, is do not extend the routine. Um, it can be really, really tempting if they say one more story or one more cuddle or one more drink. Um, you've got to be rigid on not extending the routine. That's the key thing. So that they learn that at this point, they always are going to end up in the same position in their bed, ready to sleep. That's what we want. Um, now, obviously, life happens, and these things are quite sort of um, difficult. So these, these might you might already have these in place, or you might not. I'm just going to sort of you know share them with you, and then start to think about some other techniques that might be helpful as well. So. Um, we've got about 15 minutes to think about the kind of behavioural side of sleep. And this is applied really once you have, you've sorted the physical health problems, so you're sure it's not pain, and you have got a consistent bedtime routine, you're sure that your child's sleep environment is kind of sleep inducing. Then you might want to start to think about some of the kind of ha things that are happening around sleep. So um, your response to, to how things can happen in, in the bedtime uh, routine or waking. Now, I'm going to go through this. Some of you, this is the behavioural model applied to sleep. So some of you will know this when you're thinking about uh, behaviours that challenge. You'll be kind of familiar with the concepts. Um, pure disclaimer at the start, this is not to blame you as a caregiver that you are going in and making things worse. This isn't to say that you, you're the sort of the fault. What, what this is really saying is that over time, when children learn that something happens in response to a behaviour, that can strengthen a behaviour. And as we'll see, it can actually strengthen our behaviours as caregivers as well. So I'll, I'll talk you through that. But this isn't to say that this is definitely happening and this is what's caused the problem. It might just be that there are changes that you, that you might sort of recognise this in yourself and your own patterns, and there are changes that you might want to make. Um, so th what happens with this is the child wakes up now I've applied it to waking just because that's kind of the easiest explanation but this could also be um, your child is in bed for a long prolonged period of time and they're not able to fall asleep so it could be a settling issue applied here as well 
Um, and it doesn't actually matter in this context why they've woken up. So really, they could be in pain. It could be because of that partial arousal I was talking about earlier between their sleep cycles. It could be that they were disturbed by a train going through <laughs> past their bedroom. Uh, for the sake of this model, that doesn't matter because we're, we're assuming we've ruled out pain and all the other things. We're now looking at behaviour and what changes we can make. Um, so what actually matters in this point then is, is what the child does to signal to you that they are awake or they're having trouble getting to sleep. And that's what we call a signalling behaviour. So it might be crying, it might be, um, you know, um, it could be sort of going into your bedroom and coming to get you, it could be going downstairs and rifling through the kitchen, it could be all manner of things. You, you know, <laughs> you know what your child's doing at this point. Um, and so obviously we as caregivers, if we see our child kind of tearing through something or they've, you know, they're screaming, we experience that as really, really aversive. That's really difficult to listen to or to watch. And so we're motivated to act because we need to sort of stop this behaviour or get them back to sleep. So what we're, we're going to do in this situation is engage with our child. Now, this, when I say engagement, this could be you're actually telling them off. So it might not actually seem like a really lovely, positive interaction. It might not be giving them a cuddle and getting into bed with them, or it might be. Um, but this engagement is actually really rewarding for our children and our adults. And, and if it is rewarding, it's going to increase the chance that the next time they wake up, they're going to show that same signalling behaviour. So it's not necessarily increasing their chance of physically waking, if that makes sense. It's just increasing the chance of the behaviour that happens afterwards. Um, and as I say, that's rewarding for the child, so that will continue. And then if you're able to sort of get your child back to sleep in this way, that's brilliant. They go back to sleep. But it's actually now rewarding for you, because what you've learned is that when I do this, this gets my child back to sleep. And so the next time they do it, you're going to be more likely to do the same thing. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, so perhaps if that's resonating for people, that's kind of what we call mutual reinforcement. So these two cycles are locking together. And when this happens, which is really, really common, it can be quite difficult to break, because actually for the child, they've sort of found something that works, even if they're not consciously aware of it. And as caregivers, we've found something that works, even if we're not consciously aware of it. And so it can be difficult to, to sort of meddle with these kind of um, uh, sort of uh, processes. I just want to say as well, obviously, if you as a caregiver, when this is happening overnight, you're tired yourself, aren't you? So it's going to be even more aversive because we've talked about how things can make us irritable when we're tired. Um, and we've talked about today, you're advocating for your children in every space. You might be caring for other children. You might have other kind of, you might have a job that's really stressful. This isn't at all to blame you for going in and responding to, to this. This is that, you know, there's a lot of factors why you would do this. But if you do think that this is something you, you maybe want to alter, then there are ways that you can alter it. But there isn't any kind of judgment if you don't want to. So I'm just going to present some, some techniques. Um, they might seem a bit nuts, bear with me. <laughs> and, and just to be clear, this is only once we've ruled out pain and only once we've got the kind of uh, the sort of sleep onset environment and bedtime routine sorted. I can't say this enough, do whatever works best for you, the person you care for and the wider family. There is no pressure from me to go and do any of these techniques if you think absolutely not. But for some families they are helpful and it's worth kind of presenting. Um, they all start with a sleep diary. So you, uh, it's really, really critical that you keep a sleep diary for at least two weeks before you do anything to change your, your child's sleep. Because there are things going on in your sleeping environment that you might not even be aware of, the patterns you might not be aware of until you actually start to record it. Um, so this is an example sleep diary. This is in that Cerebra Sleep Guide that I showed you, but you don't need to use this one. You can make up your own if you want to. Um, but ideally, it would have the time that you've put your child to bed, when they've woken up, <laughs> Um, what behaviours they've shown at waking and what you've done about it, what timing, um, all those sorts of things. So, <laughs> the first technique that you might want to use, now you can use this whether your child has an issue with falling asleep or with waking overnight, is called graduated extinction. Now, I should say, if they have a problem with falling asleep and waking, try and tackle the falling asleep problem first, because once they've learnt to self-soothe at the beginning of the night, they can then apply that later on. So it's best to tackle settling first if you have a joint problem. But some people may just have settling or may just have waking, so take this with how you would like it. Um, so graduated extinction, you might have heard this by another name, so some people call it the cry out method in sort of typical baby training or um, those kinds of um, paradigms. So what this basically is, 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 is agreeing a set amount of time that you will allow your child to show those signaling behaviours before you go and attend to them. Now, we recommend starting with two minutes. If that is too difficult, you don't have to start at two minutes. You can start at 30 seconds. But the key thing is, is that you don't go in instantly. 
And what you're trying to do here is just break that instant engagement in those two cycles that I showed you. So you're trying to stop the child from associating that behaviour with the following response, even, again, if they're not cognitively aware of it. Um, so what you do at this point is you, you agree that set amount of time, say it's two minutes, and after two minutes of them screaming and shouting, you go into the bedroom. Now, critically, you're checking on them for you. <laughs> so you're checking on them to know that they are safe, that they're not having a seizure, that they're not in pain, they haven't got their head stuck through the bars of a crib. <laughs> you know, they are um, OK. This is a check for you. This is not to comfort your child. This is not to sort of soothe them. This is not to reinstate the bedtime routine. This is purely for you to know that they are OK. So what you need to do is go in and try and be as cold as you possibly can. Try not to give them eye contact, try not to sort of cuddle up to them and just take them back to bed and say, it's bedtime now and go out again. Obviously, they will immediately cry again. You will need to repeat this again. This could happen a lot of times. This does usually happen a lot of times. We have to leave, wait the agreed amount of time. This, this will be a horrible night, <laughs> just, just to pre-warn you, this will be bad. But it usually it tends to work very, very quickly. So because children have learnt that that sort of hasn't been, um, the, the, the response they were expecting hasn't come, it can sort of quite quickly be a bit of a shock and they kind of unlearn the behaviour, for, for want of a better word. So the next night, you then want to extend the checking time. So if you've started with two, try and wait for three minutes. If you've started with 30 seconds, try and wait for a minute, and so on and so on. And gradually extend, again, keeping the checking brief. So at no point offer any aspect of the bedtime routine. Just to get, This is all about their safety and you knowing that. Just keep going in, putting them back to bed. Um, and over time, what happens is that that cycle is broken, and so children ultimately will be able to learn to self-soothe, so they're not reliant on you to kind of come in to help them get back to sleep. Does that sort of make sense? If people are thinking this is a bit nuts, that's okay. Oh, yes, yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I suppose um, with yourself and perhaps with a partner is what I had meant. But if you've got a child that, that can kind of understand that, you might want to kind of engage them in that process and say, yes, I don't need to come in straight away because you can do this by yourself and, and kind of try and agree that time. But if, if they don't agree in that sense, that's OK as long as you and your partner or anyone you're parenting with do. Um, yes. So that's, if you, that's kind of one method that tends to work quite quickly, but it's quite brutal. Just being honest. Um, anybody having a problem with children like not falling asleep quickly? Because I'm just aware of time. I don't want to sort of share things that aren't... Yes, great. Okay. So another technique you can try is bedtime fading. Now, this is about... This usually comes about when children have learnt, just purely by us sort of putting them to bed when we think they should go to bed, but maybe they're not tired or whatever's going on. They've, they've broken that association between the bed only being for sleep. So they've spent lots of time awake in bed overnight or in the settling period, and therefore they haven't got that sleep onset association. So this technique is about bringing that back. So it, again, it sounds mad, but what, what we would do in this situation is keep our children up later. <laughs> I, again, you don't have to do this one. If it doesn't work for you, there is no judgment from me. Um, and what you do basically is choose a bedtime where they are very, very likely to fall asleep. I'm talking like they stayed up until midnight on New Year's Eve and they fell asleep on the sofa. That, that's the kind of bedtime you're looking for. Because, again, brutal, but what you want them to do is make that association between the bed and sleep. So what you do is you select that temporary bedtime. We can quite quickly fade it back, so it, this won't happen for a very extended period of time. But you choose, say it's midnight, just for ease. What you do is you would put them to bed at midnight. So you've got to keep them up, but you don't want to keep them really, really hyped up. So try and do kind of, you can do, you can use the screen then. I'll let you use the screen, but you know what I mean. So you can do some kind of reading and some calming activities. And the idea is that you put them to bed and they fall asleep within 20 minutes. If they do that, that's brilliant. That temporary bedtime has worked. And we will kind of keep consistently doing this for a week. And then the next week, you drop a night. So you don't, you um, fade it back by about um, half an hour, something like that. So it depends on what your sort of situation is. So you want to slowly fade it back over time. If they don't fall asleep at the time of the temporary bedtime, unfortunately, you need to get them out of bed again. So if you put them into bed at midnight and they're still not asleep by 20 past midnight, you've got to get them out of bed and try again in sort of about half an hour later. Um, this is more fully outlined kind of in the guide, but the key, the key process of this is, is setting that bedtime, having them fall asleep consistently at it, and then fading it back. So the amount of time you, you want to do that by can depend on your situation. 
Anybody having a problem where they're needing to sleep in a bed with their child and they don't want to, or, yeah. Um, so gradual withdrawal can be a helpful technique here. Um, absolutely fine, I should say as well, if, if you want to co-sleep, there is no, again, there's no kind of pressure, but if, if, you're, if you're finding that difficult in your own situation, then there are sort of techniques for, for reducing that. Um, so if this is your sort of situation, what you ideally want to do is, is gradually withdraw from your child's sleeping environment. So again, over time, they learn they can fall asleep without you in the bed, or perhaps some of you are having to sit by the bed or um, situations like that. Um, so the ideal is if you're currently in the bed together, and um, what we'd advise you to do is get a camp bed and put that by your child's bed or a mattress on the floor <coughs> and just wait there until they fall asleep. If, if this is what they want, is you there until they fall asleep. And then gradually over time, you would fade that out so that it's actually a chair that can be more physically moved backwards. So again, if you're having to sit with them until they fall asleep, you can sit in your camping chair and you can just say, yeah, I'm here, mummy's here, daddy's here, um, and sort of wait for them to fall asleep. Now, this is my conceptualisation. I'm sure all of your houses look like this. This is everyone's <laughs> hallway, isn't it? And this is your child. Look, note how your child's bedroom just has a bed in it because it's not for play. Um, so here you are. You buy your child's bed in your little camp chair. Night by night, what you want to do, you might want to do it more gradually than this diagram, up to you, is fade it back all the way out so that you're sort of in the corner of the room. So you're, you're literally inching away. Some people call it the camp it out method. So you're, you're literally camping out and getting further away. And then once you're in the doorway, what you want to do is move to the top of the landing. So you want to say, you can say, yeah, I'm still here. I can still see you. Yeah, mummy's still watching you. I'm here. And then I'm sure you've all got a midpoint landing on your stairs. <laughs> um, when you get to there, you go, yeah, yeah, daddy can still hear you. Yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Until you can sort of fade it actually to downstairs. And you, what you've got then with the child is, yeah, I'm still watching you, but I'm downstairs. And there's some kind of concept of you're still sort of overseeing things, but you don't have to be lying in bed with them. And then over time, you can then, you know, if you're downstairs, you can get a cup of tea, you can watch TV. But, th but they still have the sense that you're kind of with them in that. Does that kind of make sense? Um, the other thing, that this only works if children wake at the same time every night. So this is why you would need a sleep diary. So it's like, this is actually really important. I don't know if this is a problem for people generally waking at the same time overnight. Not seeing a lot of nods. I'll just briefly explain just in case it is. What this is about is that sleep cycle that I was telling you about. So if children tend to go to bed at the same time every night and wake up for the day at the same time, but they wake up every morning at 3 a.m., say. What that says to me is there's something going wrong, for want of a better word, we don't know what it is, with their sleep cycle. And so if they're sort of like tripping out of sleep, essentially, at the same time, what you can do is go in and actually wake them. Again, I know these sound nuts, but they do work. Half an hour before the time that they would normally wake. Now, when I say wake, I mean lightly touch awake. Don't fully shake them and get them out of bed. Um, what you want them to sort of roll over, open their eyes, and then roll back. If your child doesn't do that when they wake up, don't try this one. <laughs> so you don't want to sort of make the problem worse. But for some children, this can be really helpful because it sort of jolts them back down into the next sleep cycle. And so they don't have their um, original waking time. And then over time, what you want to do is do this for a week. And then the next week, you drop a night. And then the next week, you drop a night until you're not actually having to go in to wake them. Now, this might be fine if your child's normal time of waking is 10 and you're actually already up and you're going to go up and brush your teeth at half nine anyway. You can gently shake them awake. Might be worth a go. If they wake at 3 a.m., maybe you don't want to set an alarm at half two to go and do it. So that's, I'll just kind of share that with you. That's just an option. But if for some children who do wake early in the cycle, this can actually be really helpful because you're already up anyway. So you may as well give it a go. Um, other couple of novel things that we've learned just from working with families that have tried these and it hasn't sort of been a good fit. Um, the helpfulness of, of sort of being able to think about what the aim of the sleep intervention is. So I just want to say, if you're, if you're here and you want to get more sleep for your child, that's brilliant, that's great. If you also want to get more sleep as a family, that's also a very worthy sleep intervention target. Sleep is as important for you and for your other children as it is for your child with fragile X. And so if there are actually just, you want techniques to sort of keep your child quietly happy because they are going to wake up and there's sort of nothing you feel you've tried everything else then it might be that you can just think about perhaps having a camera in their bedroom away a bit sort of like one of those baby monitors that you can talk through just so you can sort of say to them yeah I'm here I can see you but you don't actually have to go in and sort of fully engage with them if, if that would help you or perhaps your other children well, the other thing that I think is really genius that this is a family told me about this, a child with another rare genetic syndrome. Um, so this isn't my idea at all, but these are lock boxes that you can just buy on Amazon. 
And what they do is you can put whatever you want inside. So you could put a snack or a screen or a book or something. Um, and essentially, you can time them so that they will only open at 5 a.m., for example. And so if your child wakes at quarter to five every day and you just want something to keep them busy, even if it's just to give you an extra half an hour of your own sleep, you can time that lockbox so it will open at that time and they can access it only at that point to then kind of keep them engaged and entertained at that time so that you and your other children can, can get some more sleep. So that's a technique from another family. Um, I hope that's helpful. I've been quite aware of time, so I've sort of sped through, but we talked about how sleep's important. We talked about infragile X um, and the importance of ruling out pain and then other kind of factors that we could take. I'm just going to share some resources because I said I would. So that's the QR code for the sleep guide. Uh, this one is for the pain guide. And then if you just want the flack, um, the pain guide will tell you more about the flack if you just want that. Um, and otherwise, just to say thank you. Um, and then I can take some quick questions if that's helpful. Yeah.